Well, good morning, Bethel Church, morning. both here and those of you who are watching online right now as we're streaming live. And uh, I want to continue to say to our whole church, those of you who can't be here um, this morning in person, we miss you. Uh, we love you. Uh, we're thrilled that you can take the option uh, of being at home and still participating in worship this morning. And uh, I think I can speak for all of us when I say we long for the day when we will be unfettered, yeah? Uh, without masks, without distance, without limitations. Uh, I look forward to the day when I can just greet a person on a Sunday morning with a great big hug. And uh, so we long for these things. And I uh, want to ask you um, now, I'm going to uh, we're going to pray uh, before we go to the Word, and uh, I'm going to pray um, passionately that, that God would change uh, the way things are, because uh, I don't know about you, but I'm tired of a lot of things, and um, I don't want to just stew on that. I want to take that to my God who can do something about that, either in the world or in my heart, so uh, would you pray with me right now? Father, um, we are living in a time, as you know, where our hearts are grieved with the uh, way things are. Um, a nation uh, in the midst of unrest, tensions, anger, hostility. Uh, we're living with, of course, this virus, which just reminds us of the pervasiveness of sin. We're living in a time of limitation uh, some are living in fear. Some are living um, with angst. What we all know and agree upon, Lord, is things are not as they should be. They're not as you made them to be. And we do long for the shalom, um, God, that you knit into the world, that you promised to restore. We long for it. Uh, so, Lord, we come to you because you can do something about these things. We ask, God, that you would change the hearts and minds of mankind who um, are too slow to listen and too quick to speak. We pray for injustice in this world, Lord, that it would be put down wherever and whatever it looks like. We pray, God, that this virus would be quelled, um, that a vaccine would come soon if that would be the way that you would deal with it, Lord that we could get back to normal. But even as everyone has been touched, uh, Lord, with a sense of uh, their mortality, we pray, Lord, that that might result in people coming to a saving knowledge of you. So, Father, we come to you. You can do something about this. We come in the name of Jesus, who is our Savior, who rightly orients us to you. And we pray with the help of your Holy Spirit, who corrects and provides beautiful utterances to our prayers. Have your way, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, if you would turn your Bible, turn in your Bible to Luke chapter 5, and as you're doing that, I'll give you a reminder. Uh, we hope that each week you will sign up and let us know what service you're coming to. You never know when we might do a raffle and you'll be entered. Uh, this is a helpful tool for you guys so that we can kind of space some things out. We've got a really kind of... Um, We'd love to balance the numbers a little more than we are. If you can help us do that, that'd be great, just to kind of um, keep, keep our uh, distances good, but at the same time, providing a rich, lively service each time we meet so it doesn't just kind of pinnacle all at one. So if you can kind of help us uh, with those online registrations, you just need to tell us what service you're coming to and how many. That's it. We're not asking for your social security number or who you voted for. So uh, that's all we want from you. So please... Uh, please do that each and every week. Um, I am just getting back to town from a couple of weeks uh, off on vacation, and uh, I, I brought an illustration from my vacation this morning. You might be able to tell what I was doing. Uh, here is my favorite fly rod right now. And a dear friend of mine, Ben Kies, who is the director of uh, Labrie in Southboro, Massachusetts, came out, and we spent 12 days traveling around the interior of Alaska fly fishing and it was excellent, and many fish evaded us, many fish. So I've got, I've got to practice this, guys, just so you know. But I bring this in this morning because I wanted to show you uh, <clears throat> kind of some funny things here. Uh, you can see this fly attached to my, my line, and some of you know what this is. You can see it even from where you are. But this is known as a Dalai Lama. 
That's what it is, it's a fly. It's a horrendous fly. It, as somebody said earlier this morning, looks like something the cat hooked up. And that's, that's about right. That's about what it looks like. And this particular fly is a great irritation to the purists in fly fishing because we like flies that look more like, this is, this is the black version of what I have on there, but we like flies that look a little more like this. Here's a little board of these different intricately tied flies. These are actually known as uh, nymphs. Most of them, there's a few dry flies in there. And... Um, it's funny because traditionalists and purists and fly fishing will tie their own flies. And they love to get intricate about these things using chenille and little uh, flash marabou and, and um, feathers and hackle and wire and beads and all kinds of uh, fancy things to dress this fly up and make it look irresistible to a fish. And they get this thing looking so beautiful, but a fish may refuse it. And yet a fish will hit this ugly, this awful looking thing known as a dolly. And it creates a real agitation in the traditional fly fishing community. They can't believe and they are frustrated by the fact that a fish would take a dolly over something they have worked so hard on to make beautiful. And believe it or not, we find the same kind of thing going on in our passage this morning in Luke chapter 5, starting at verse 27, uh, where we find the traditionalists, the Pharisees, had a sense of what ministry ought to look like, had a sense of the way God worked in the world, had their rules, their man-made uh, constructs uh, around faith, and Jesus did not fit into them, and he ruffled uh, their feathers. Uh, in, in chapter 5, what we find here, just to give you a little bit of context, we find really the beginning of Jesus' um, non-traditional public ministry, uh, we see him calling his first disciples. Uh, we see the kind of people that Jesus regularly and easily interacted with. And, um, and his ministry, as I've said, is very unlike the ministry of the Pharisees and um, of sort of their traditions. Uh, he didn't march to the beat of their drum. Jesus healed with power. Jesus exercised the prerogatives of deity when he offers forgiveness to one just prior to healing him. Uh, Jesus ate and drank with what the religious leaders called sinners and tax collectors. And so what we find here in this passage uh, is that overall Jesus' popularity, his breaking of the religious traditions, his claim to be able to forgive sin, and his fraternizing with the riffraff of society drew the ire of the religious leaders. They disliked him. Uh, they began to question him and challenge him and challenge the legitimacy of his ministry. What I want you to take away from this passage this morning that I'm about to read is this, that Jesus is after the transformation of souls more than keeping the traditions of man. Jesus is after the transformation of souls more than the traditions of mankind. So look with me in Luke 5, uh, starting at verse 27. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi standing at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up. He left everything and followed him. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to the disciples, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The first thing I want to uh, get about proclaiming this morning is this, that the grace of God is greater than all of our sin. All of our sin collectively, all of our sin individually. The grace of God is greater. And we see this specifically in the life of Matthew. And I want to explain this kind of from his vocation. When we hear that Matthew is a tax collector, we probably think to ourselves, yeah, that sounds like an unpopular job. Tax collector, no thank you. 
Uh, that's really nice of Jesus to go and sit with someone who isn't normally at the cool kids' table. That's great. And you and I know that there are uh, professions in our day and age that are unpopular as well. Uh, I think working for the IRS would qualify. If you work for the IRS, you probably keep that to yourself as long as you can, right? You don't lead with that in conversation. Uh, there's a certain stigma often attached to lawyers in our culture today. I'm not attaching that stigma. It's just there, just to be clear. Even something like used car salesmen, right? It kind of tends to mean something in people's mind. It's not real popular. And let me tell you, I understand. I, after all, am a clergy, a pastor. Do you think that's popular in all circles today? Uh, the answer is no, by the way. It's not. And sometimes I use this to my advantage, uh, especially on an airplane when I'm traveling. And the person next to me sits down and says, so what do you do for a living? And if I feel like talking, I'll say something like, I work for a nonprofit in Alaska. And they're all ears. Really, tell me about it. What do you do? And I can actually uh, set up an interesting conversation. If I don't want to talk, which is more often than not, if I'm honest, I look at them and I say, I'm a conservative Baptist preacher in the church in Fairbanks, in a Baptist church. Uh, would you like to hear my sermon for Sunday? <laughs> and then we're usually done. <laughs> That's it. Good night. Have a good rest. Um, but Levi's occupation is a bigger problem than just being unpopular. Uh, in the first century Palestinian world, a tax collector was considered a thief and a traitor. A traitor because they are collecting taxes that would be turned over to the occupying forces of Rome. So you can imagine one of your own countrymen taking from you to give to one you don't think has a legitimate reason for being there. So they are a traitor for that reason and oftentimes thieves because they would very commonly take, you know, a little extra commission. Let's call it a commission. And it would often vary. I like this person, low commission. I don't like this person give it up. And so tax collectors were very often unscrupulous in their practices. So a traitor and very possibly a thief, at least by reputation, if not in actuality. So when Jesus is, is calling this man to follow him, he's not just calling someone out of an unpopular profession. He's calling a cold-blooded sinner to repentance and to a life of discipleship, and to forgiveness. And he's doing it purely based upon grace and mercy. And friends, I want to just remind you of this. You may be sitting here this morning, you may be considering the invitation of Jesus to be a follower of his, and you might think to yourself, you know, I got a background. I got a past, I got a record, I got stuff. And you don't even know my stuff. And I would want to say to you, there is no such thing as an unforgivable sin. There is no pattern of sin that is too long. There is no secret sin that's too deep. There is no offense that is too great. The grace of God is greater than all of our sin. The specialty of God is restoring and renovating and redeeming that which was broken and turning them uh, to right relationship with himself through Jesus Christ. In fact, if you were looking for a summary line for the entire message of the Bible, it would sound something like this. God is redeeming a broken world to himself and he is doing this in the person of Jesus Christ. There's maybe a second implication here. Maybe you're of this group that's considering following Jesus and you're not sure. You're not even sure if he can forgive all of your sin. But maybe you're sitting here as a Christian and you have fallen into, I think, a whole other trap that the devil uses, which is something like this. You've started with the grace and mercy of God. You have responded to this call to follow him. And yet you've moved from grace and mercy to a place of performance-based spirituality where you kind of think of your status with God as either secure or insecure based upon how you're doing. 
I will tell you that uh, I don't think any of us is immune from this temptation. I find it even regularly at work in me. And one of the surprising areas I have found it lately has been in my prayer life. When I hear the language of my own prayers, which can sound something like this. God, won't you just give me such and such? Won't you please just do this or that? Won't you stop this or this? Or just help this to occur after all, I've done this and this and this. Or I haven't done this and this, so God, wouldn't you? Do you find yourself doing that? You don't have to nod visibly. I find that voicing in my prayers more often than I would like to admit. And I, I would expose my, my own heart and, and yours with the question, do we really want God to deal with us based upon our performance? I'm reminded of the words of Jerry Bridges who says, everything this side of hell is grace. I need the grace of God more right now in my life than ever before. Or maybe I should say, I am aware of my need of the grace of Christ in my life more now than I ever was before. I do not want God to deal with me based upon performance. I love the words of Brennan Manning controversial figure, but one who has had a profound encounter with the living God and with his grace. I love his comments. He says, my deepest awareness of myself is that I am deeply loved by God and I have done nothing to earn or deserve that. Matthew is a vocational trader, very possibly a thief, and he's had an encounter with the grace of God and when Jesus calls Matthew to follow him in discipleship, it's not because he's a good guy who can really help out the kingdom. He calls him to follow Jesus in spite of his track record. It seems to me that the magnanimous offer of Christ to Matthew here, the grace given, is effective in the call to him. In other words, it, it seems to me that it's grace and not guilt that compels him to discipleship. Maybe you've run into this in your life. It's those people who are aware of their need of grace who are more likely to accept it. Those who think they're doing pretty good are some of the ones that are most resistant to the grace and mercy of God. The second point I want to draw out of our passage this morning is this. The discipleship is greater than non-discipleship. Verse 27, after this Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up and left everything and followed him. I mean, the turkey did it. It's kind of amazing. Don't let the familiarity of the text let it blow past you. Jesus gave him like three words, two words, follow me. That was it. It wasn't like a persuasive speech ensued here. But the immediacy and the completeness of Matthew's response, I think, are quite shocking. You almost want to ask him, hey, you want to think about that first? This is kind of a big deal. He left everything. And actually, as we read through uh, the gospel of, of Luke, if we were to kind of read even just this whole chapter and a little bit before it, you would find that this was kind of the common response of those that Jesus offered the invitation to follow him. They left everything. Peter, James, John, and now Matthew. There's a pattern brewing here. They left everything and they followed him. To those of you who are considering the call of Jesus to become his follower, I would simply tell you this. Don't settle for a life of half measure. Don't settle for a measured, calculated response. If you hear the call of Jesus upon your life to be his follower, go all in right now and you won't regret it. You won't regret it. There's a cost but there's a payoff way better than the cost. Embrace that call. Do it for your own good. The invitation of Jesus is a life-giving venture. And I think sometimes that can be a little difficult for us to believe. We're not sure if we believe that. You may be aware of um, some figures in Christianity, an author known as uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Doesn't that sound like a really nice, gentle guy? Dietrich, if I had a Doberman Pinscher, I would name him Dietrich. <laughs> Sounds like a nice fella. 
He's written a book by the, by the title of The Cost of Discipleship. And very early on, he opens with the words, when Christ bids a man, he bids him come die. That's kind of ominous, you know? That's not like a lovely invitation. You think, is this really what I want? Is this really what I want? It's not wrong. I mean, Jesus offered similar words, right? Take up your cross, which was an instrument of death, not a piece of jewelry. Take up your cross and follow me. Well, here's the thing. Well, Bonhoeffer's not wrong. I don't think he ever got around to writing the sequel to his book, which needs to be written, which is this, the treasure of discipleship, the goodness of it, the glory of it, the wonder of it. And this is something that Jesus teaches. We see this in the parable of the field and the parable of the pearl of great price. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, he went and sold all that he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and he bought it. And so it is with turning our lives over to Jesus in obedient discipleship to him. Yes, there's a cost, but there's a treasure that far outweighs the cost. What we do, we sell the fallow field of a godless life. What we inherit, the treasure of the kingdom of God. And life abundantly. The initial loss is far outweighed by the eventual gain. There is a book that I read a while back. I don't know if you have books like this. There are some books on my shelf that I have been strongly tempted to throw or maybe have. This is one of them. I didn't even list it in your notes for that reason. I like about 80% of this book. I love about 10% of it, and I hate about 10% of it. But Joshua Ryan Butler, uh, I think, got this right, and this was really helpful for me. Uh, where he talks about, um, uh, well, what it means to be human. Listen to this. There is an unhelpful assumption here that sin is an essential part of being human. This is backward. Sin attacks and degrades our humanity. It makes us less human, not more. By not sinning, Jesus is more human than we are. He's less like an athlete using steroids and more like an athlete who never ate Twinkies. Less like an adult competing against kindergartners and more like an adult who actually trained because he enjoys the sport while we sat around all year watching TV, eating potato chips, and didn't even bother to show up to the race. Jesus doesn't use a superhuman advantage to win. He refuses the inhumanity we all participate in. Jesus is true humanity. And when Jesus calls us to discipleship, he is calling us to be human as he made us to be human. He is calling us back into the life that he gave to us originally. Discipleship is God's way of giving us our lives back. Jesus is the exemplar of that. That is what discipleship is. There is a cost. But there is a great reward both in this life and in the life to come. When Amy and I first got married, uh, we both needed two cars. She was a a student in school still, and uh, I was working my first job, and um, we were poor, and so we had two lousy cars. Uh, She had a Geo Prism. Best thing about this thing is it was red. Uh, The second best thing was it got like 40 miles to the gallon, which was awesome. But it was a death trap, so she drove it. And... uh, (laughs) Uh, and I actually prayed, I'm kidding about that. I, I actually, <laughs> I can hear the emails already coming in. Um, I, had, I prayed that God, I said, God, I, I can't afford a nice car. Would you give me a fun car? That was my prayer. You know, you ask for what you want. And uh, I found this 1972 Toyota Land Cruiser FJ40. And if you don't know what that is, it looks like a Jeep. I'll just say that. And I really fell in love with this thing. It was kind of rough, and the body was in good shape, but the interior and the mechanics were a little bit off. It needed some work. And uh, I bought it cheap and just kind of fell in love with the idea of, I want to restore this thing over time. 
And uh, everybody in town in Yakima, Washington said, you gotta take this thing over to Mr. Buckley. Gordon Buckley is the man. He knows these things inside and out. He had one, his wife had one. He used to work at a Toyota dealership and sold them. And anytime you drove by his shop, there was a handful of them out in the yard. That was his specialty. I don't know if you've ever had an opportunity to stand next to someone who knows a machine inside and out and can just work their magic on it. But that's a delight, especially for a guy who can barely turn a wrench. So I took it to Mr. Buckley because it was running wrong. Uh, it was running rich, uh, so there's just really smelly fumes. It was backfiring. It was revving too high. I just, I just couldn't get it. It was somewhere between stalling or running too rich, and I couldn't find the middle. Couldn't figure it out. Took it to him. He opened up the hood and he looked at it and he just laughed. With one second of looking at it, he just shook his head and says, somebody put a lawnmower air filter in here. And it wasn't really a lawnmower air filter, but it might as well have been. It was just this little tiny thing sitting on top of the carburetor. And he just laughed and he goes, hang on, I got one in back. He goes to the back of this Magic Kingdom shop that he had and pulls out the right air cleaner, which is about 10 inches tall and about 14 inches around. It's massive. It's easily 10 times the size of the one that was on there. He took the old one off, didn't have a bracket for it. He manufactured one on the spot, just took some metal, welded it together, drilled the right holes, put it in place, hooked everything up, started up the car, made the adjustments, and it just settled into this happy little purr started idling low, the smell was gone, and my coughing, sputtering Jeep-styled car was happy. It's like, this is how it was made to be. And I want to say, friends, this is the picture of what God is doing for us in Jesus Christ when we come to discipleship in him. He is restoring us to the way we ought to be. Somebody has said it provocatively that Jesus didn't come to make us Christians, came to make us humans. Being a Christian is a means to an end. And when we follow Jesus in discipleship, we are returning to what God has made us to be originally. We are saved by his death and by his resurrection from the guilt and consequence of our sin. But there is also a kind of salvation in his life. We find this uh, in Romans 5. Paul says, for if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only in this, but we also boast uh, in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Soren Kierkegaard, the Danish philosopher, also cautioned, uh, I think really wisely, sort of almost to the words of Bonhoeffer, though that uh, he came uh, earlier, but he said this, it costs a man as much or more to go to hell than it does to come to heaven. The cost of non-discipleship is great indeed. I want you to hear this. Discipleship is greater than non-discipleship. What Jesus calls us to is good. It is costly, but it is good. Thirdly here, our salvation demands great praise. Verse 29. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his home. And a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to the disciples, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And so I want you to see how this salvation and this call to discipleship has affected the heart and the actions of Matthew. He throws a party for Jesus. It's not just a party and Jesus is invited. It's for Jesus. He puts him front and center in his life. In other words, discipleship for him is not a matter of reluctance or secrecy or half measures or something to keep kind of quiet. Matthew goes public with his faith. He doesn't just slip slyly out of his old ways here. His faith becomes public. His praise and adoration of Jesus goes public. No such thing as private faith. There is a radical transformation. He leaves everything 
He honors Christ publicly. There is a public witness. And notice who's on the invite list. Not those who agree with him, but those who need him. When I say that our great salvation demands great praise, I'm not suggesting that you sing louder, especially for some of you. (laughs) I'm suggesting that you be more thoroughly transformed by the person and the nature of Jesus Christ. That you would grow in loving God and loving your neighbor, and that would be your response. Some practical application here. Perhaps you, as a follower of Jesus Christ, whether new or old, have never come forward in believer's baptism. This is a wonderful way to go public with your faith. The heart of it is to say, I have turned and I'm following Jesus. I'm willing to stand up front and go through this act that pictures what God has done for me in Christ, that I have died to sin, been cleansed and raised to new life, and I do it publicly in front of my church family. I'll be honest with you. I don't even know how we would do that right now, but if you want to be baptized, I'll figure it out with you. So maybe it's time for you to come forward in believer's baptism. Some of you just need to get better at identifying publicly as a Christian. Just let that become a part of your everyday speech instead of speaking in hushed religious tones in Fred Meyer. You ever notice this? You bring up church and Fred's or something like that and you say it quieter? I was listening to NPR the other day and of all places, I was shocked to hear a man give a report and say, as a Christian, this is particularly offensive to me. And I was like, what a great way to start a sentence. I'm a Christian, and someone invites you to go and do something, don't just say, you know, that's not really my bag. I don't really do that, as though you were particularly virtuous in and of yourself. Be willing to say, do you know, I'm a Christian. As a follower of Christ, my convictions lead me to a different course of action. Publicly identify with Christ in winsome ways in your everyday speech. Lastly here, our great salvation demands great love. The praise piece that we see in Matthew, this is really our vertical dimension of between us and the Lord. There's a horizontal impact to our faith too, which is how we love those that God loves. And I actually think that's a really helpful way to think about it because sometimes, you know, we know we're called upon to love this person and we just think, I don't want to. They're a jerk. They don't deserve my love. Have you seen them? Do you know what they act like? I don't want to love them. I don't have it within me to love a person like that. And sometimes it's helpful just to go, you know what? God loves them. And I love God. Surely that will help catapult me to love that which God loves. And I think we see something like this right here at this particular scene. Uh, What we are meant to be offended by is the voicing of these religious leaders who said, why are you eating with these people? Tax collectors and sinners. Not really our kind. And there was a particular offense because table fellowship with with folks in the uh, first century world really meant almost a mutual acceptance. I accept you, you accept me, we care for one another. And so we are meant to actually be offended by the way that the religious leaders respond to these folks. Matthew gets it right. Jesus gets it right. when they're not worried about being tainted by the outward acts of these people. And instead, their love precedes their engagement with them. And they welcome them and enjoy them. I will tell you this. Loving broken people who are alienated from God, even those who maybe are ripping off their fellow man, or are still happily in the throes of sin, is a difficult, painful, and tiresome way of relating to people. I'll also say this. If you're not doing that in any way in your life, may I ask the question, are you following Jesus? This was the manner of his ministry. His manner of connection and association was not to the lovely, but to those who had need. And it is to this that we are called. I will also tell you that in my own personal experience, 
being engaged in relationships and caring love with people whose lives are messy and who are broken and who are not yet right. <laughs> it's not only painful and tiresome, but it's heartbreaking because I find, honestly, more of them, less of them choose the path of discipleship and they choose to go their own way. That's where most of them go. And it's brutal. When you put yourself out there and you love them and you get involved in their messy world because of the gospel, because of Jesus, and they go their own way. But that is the heartbreak of being on mission for Jesus. And so I will close with that question to you. Are you on mission for Jesus? Engaging the lost and broken world and helping them reorder their lives for God and for their neighbor. Pray with me. Uh, Holy Spirit of God, uh, we recall to ourselves that your word uh, does not sit easily in our hand. It is not a pet that bows to our wishes and wants. It is a knife that is sharp. It cuts. It cuts us to the heart. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would surgically and precisely convict each and every one where they need to be. May they be uh, led by you, God, in the ways that they would reconstruct aspects of their life. May we be serious about the call to follow Jesus, recognizing its costs and embracing the treasure. And may we be as generous with it, with others, as you have been with us. We pray this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for being here today, and uh, go with God. <laughs>